Hey everyone, uh, welcome to our live stream. I hope you like the doco. Um, so in a moment we'll have uh, Captain Peter Hammerstedt uh, and Ali and Lucy Tabrizi on um, to just, uh, Peter will tell you a little bit about our campaigns and, and what we're currently doing as you saw in, in the documentary there. And uh, and yeah, uh, Ali and Lucy Tabrizi, of course, the, the two directors of the uh, Netflix documentary uh, Seaspiracy, I'm sure uh, you all know. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll let Peter uh, Peter on here. Welcome, Peter, to this to the stream. Thank you so much, Lucas. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this premiere of of our short film. Uh, movies like Seaspiracy, uh, short films like the one you just saw, are so important because the issues facing the oceans happen because the oceans are out of sight and out of mind for most people. I think it was Sir Paul McCartney who said that if slaughterhouses had glass walls, then everybody would be a vegetarian. Now imagine if those slaughterhouses were dozens or hundreds or even thousands of nautical miles offshore, accessible only by boat. Sea Shepherd's campaigns allows access to those slaughterhouses. Films are important because they get people talking about the issues, they set the political agenda, but they also they inspire action. And the action that we're taking in West Africa with our partner governments is critically important. <laughs> the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the UNFAO, estimate that 90% of the world's fisheries are either fully exploited or overexploited. And exacerbating that serious overfishing problem is the fact that 20% of the global catch of fish is caught through illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, so-called IUU fishing. That means one out of five fish caught is caught illegally. In the waters of West Africa, that number is closer to four out of 10 fish. Most people probably think that most people probably think that you can just go out to sea and, and find fish anywhere, but fish tend to congregate around sea mounts and continental shelves and, and reef systems, which means that 90% of the world's fish is actually caught in the waters of countries, meaning that there is a country with the jurisdiction, with the authority to actually enforce the laws in place. So if we're serious about dealing with the issue of overfishing, one of the biggest problems facing the world's oceans, then surely we need to start with eliminating illegal fishing, a big component of the overfishing problem and one where we already have the laws on our place. And we cannot do this work in a vacuum. We have to do it in partnership with the governments that have the authority. We're currently working with eight African countries, uh, including Benin, the Gambia, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Gabon, Sao Tome and Principe, Tanzania and Namibia. And we come up with a very novel approach. Basically, we provide a ship as a civilian offshore patrol vessel. We provide the fuel to run that ship and we provide the operating crew, the engineering officers, the deck officers who, who manage the ship. Our government partner provides the law enforcement agents uh, from the Navy, from the Coast Guard, from the Fisheries Authority, with the authority to board, inspect, and arrest vessels. And working with these eight countries, we've assisted those countries to arrest 68 vessels for illegal fishing and other fisheries crime. One of those vessels was the Libico 2. You saw this vessel in the film. And I think the Libico 2 is illustrative of the issue. Uh, back in the 1990s, this vessel was part of a fleet of about 50 ships operating in the North Atlantic targeting deep sea sharks. And so effective were they that in just a three year period of time, deep sea shark populations fell to 20% their pre-fishing number. And there's something really important with the plastic pollution problem that's related to that issue. Every two months, each one of these vessels was losing 30 kilometers of gill net as ghost net. That's 30 kilometers of gill net per ship that would drift and drift and drift almost indefinitely until it finally washes ashore somewhere, killing every marine creature in its path until it does so. 30 kilometers of gill net times 50 ships is 1,500 kilometers of gill net by just these 50 vessels. And that's the equivalent of 750 tons of marine plastic pollution in the form of gill nets every single month. These campaigns are so important because we were just by you supporting us, by getting our ships to sea, we were able to assist the Liberian Coast Guard to arrest the Libico 2. Every day that the Libico 2 spent in port was lives saved. 
in the two years that it has not been fishing, the actions of Sea Shepherd supported by you have saved the lives of over a million sharks. Those are the kind of successes that Sea Shepherd is able to offer. We're able to take your generous donations and translate them directly into lives saved. What I really like about these West Africa campaigns is that there's something in them to appeal to anybody. There's an overlap between animal rights, between environmental uh, protection, and with social justice. In terms of animal rights, every day that one of these ships spends in port detained is tens of thousands of lives saved. If one of these vessels is forfeited to the state, then they'll never kill marine wildlife again. With these campaigns in West Africa, we're saving more marine wildlife than we've ever done before. In terms of environmental protection, our partner country, Gabon, established Africa's largest network of marine protected areas, setting aside 26% of Gabonese waters as a marine protected area. But marine protected areas are only worth uh, their weight on paper if there's enforcement. And what we're able to do is give the legislation bite to ensure that patrols deter incursions into these marine protected areas, allowing them to recover, allowing for ecological resistance and saving marine wildlife. And then from a social justice aspect, in many cases, we're the only line of defense preventing some of the world's wealthiest fishing companies from some of the world's wealthiest countries stealing from some of the world's poorest people. And in fact, about a month ago, I returned back from Sierra Leone, our latest country partner, where we're working together with the Sierra Leone Navy under the direction of the Ministry of National Defense. Under the direction of the Ministry of National Defense, we assisted the Navy to arrest five vessels in less than 50 hours. Three of these ships were arrested, making incursions into an inshore exclusion zone reserved for artisanal fishing communities. And all five of these vessels were fishing without a license. After the fifth arrest happened, the remaining fishing vessels fishing in Sierra Leonean waters all retreated back to port to avoid these boardings and inspections. And for the entire month that Sea Shepherd's vessel was present, not a single one of these vessels went out to fish. It's impossible to quantify the lives saved by action like that. I think we've set up an important model that other countries can adopt. If we can shut down illegal fishing in Gabon and Liberia, then we can do so in West Africa. If we can shut down illegal fishing in West Africa, then we can do so around the entire African continent. If we can do that there, then we can shut down illegal fishing off the coast of Latin America, off the coast uh, of uh, the su Southern Europe in the Mediterranean, in the South Pacific, all around the world. But we can really only make that possible thanks to your support. So on behalf of myself and my crew, thank you so much for supporting our efforts. Um, you are the reason why we're able to be on the front lines saving marine wildlife. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter. Um, it's always really great to hear what happens on the front lines. I'm sure our, our audience out here uh, appreciates it too and then gets a glimpse into uh, into what we have what we have going on and what they are uh, you know funding in in the end um with that said i'd like to uh to bring on uh, ali and lucy tabrizi of uh seaspiracy fame um they both directed uh seaspiracy that recently came out on netflix just about what almost two months ago so uh yeah welcome to the to uh, to here guys Thanks for having us, Lucas, yeah, so and uh, incredible overview of the work you guys have been doing in West Africa. It's it's super important. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so uh, I'm sure we want to get right to the questions. Um, so uh, I'm just looking looking through here. So so obviously uh, all of you, if you have any questions for for uh, Peter or for Ali and Lucy. Uh, please do write them in the in the comments. We will be uh, trying to to pick out the best ones here. Um, Peter, maybe you're a you're a good one to to answer this question from Andy Zetman. Do you see an increase in our support since Seaspiracy has gone viral? We've seen a tremendous increase in support. Donations have come in. Uh, we've seen an increase in applications from people who want to volunteer on our ships. We've seen an increase in applications from people who want to volunteer on shore. And I think that really speaks to the strength of the film. Um, it, people watch this film and their takeaway is that they can't just passively sit by and expect these problems to go away. Governments aren't going to solve all of our problems. Their own individual involvement is required to help turn this tide of destruction. 
one area of individual responsibility is, is looking at your lifestyle choices in terms of the food you eat and the, the, the things you consume. Um, but another is, is taking a step beyond that as well and, and going that extra effort and, and joining a crew like a Sea Shepherd crew, helping these governments to turn back the tide of destruction. So the support's been overwhelming. Uh, I'm, I'm touched by it every single day. Our crew receive all kinds of great messages of support, which I know encourages them and, and fuels their passion um, on the high seas. So uh, I, I thank you again for everybody who's turned out for the film and, and for all of our new supporters as well. Right. So um, we, of course, have some more questions here. Um, we have... Uh... Millie here asking uh, Ali and Lucy, how did you uh, how did you end up getting started with Seaspiracy? Obviously, Seaspiracy tells some of that story, but but there must be more behind it. Yeah, I mean, making a documentary is an incredibly long process and it involves a lot of research and a lot of traveling to get the footage. But what really started off um, my interest in, in starting this project and, and what really drew, drew Lucy to, I think, was that no one had really told the full picture, the whole story of the ocean. There's been some great documentaries in the past that were about some more single issue uh, campaigns. Maybe it was the dolphins that get killed in Taiji or the sharks that are finned for, for shark fin soup in, in Asia and the plastic pollution problem. But it really felt like something was missing. And I, I think the more we were researching uh, about the plastics washing up and, 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 the dolphin, and the dolphins issues, it all seemed to be connected. And I think that was really spurring us on to, to continue with the film and, and get it to light of day. That's great. Um, and, and speaking of, you know, uh, that, that whole topic, um, there's actually uh, Sherry Hershey's here is asking, uh, what about MSC? Is their work reliable? <laughs> Do you want to answer that one? You, you go for it. <laughs> The thing about the MSC is, from, from what we were able to research and find out about them, only a small amount actually made it into the film. Uh, and so there's actually a lot more evidence that, that shows malpractice, conflict of interest, and fisheries that are clearly not anywhere close to what you and I would consider sustainable. But because of the, the measures that they have, they, they make it through the, the test and it gets the sustainable blue tick. And an example of that um, is what's happening in, in New Zealand. There's the Ho Hokie fishery. And, uh, some, some reports came out in recent years that showed that for the past six decades, the New Zealand fisheries were underreporting their catch, and it could be anywhere to up to 2.7 times as much as what they're actually catching. The, the, the fishing industry there is, is extremely responsible for the depletion of critically endangered uh, dolphins, like the Hectors and the Maui dolphin, and yet those fisheries are being classified as sustainable by the MSC, despite government reports, scientific reports. It's like the MSC have been ignoring it. And if, um, if, if I could add to that, uh, Lucas, um, one of the vessels that we assisted the Liberian Coast Guard to arrest off the coast of Liberia was a vessel that was caught fishing without a license in the waters of Liberia, um, fishing using gear that didn't have the required turtle excluder device that was required under the law for their sustainable certification process that they were engaged in. And this was a vessel that was sustainably certified, not by the MSC, but by another third party certifier uh, to export sustainably caught shrimp to the European Union and to the United States. And yet this vessel was caught in Liberian waters without a license and caught not using the proper gear. In rea the reality is that you cannot manage what you cannot measure. And because there's a limit in terms of boardings and inspections at sea, there's, there's limitations to monitoring, control, and surveillance at sea, it's very, very difficult to measure what's really happening and therefore very difficult to manage. Um, and uh, and on that uh, on that topic as well, or not on that specific topic, but but just uh, illegal illegal uh, fishing in general. Um, you know, it's it's a huge topic, and and you know that's why you ended up making a whole documentary about it, Ali and Lucy, and that's why you know Sea Shepherd has focused so much on it the past what five six years. Um, and we actually have a question here. Miguel is asking, what are the biggest challenges it comes uh, when it comes to tackling uh, illegal fishing? Peter? One of the biggest challenges is monitoring control and surveillance. Uh, a lot of countries 
don't have the vessel assets that can cover the entirety of their sovereign waters. Um, that that that's a major problem. There's there's a lot of groups and a lot of organizations that are doing incredible work in terms of uh, surveillance technologies, like providing satellite imagery. Um, different vessel tracking uh, technologies. And this is really, really important in creating transparency, in creating accountability. But unless a country has the ability to act on that information, to bring law enforcers, to bring police to the scene of the crime, then this information is just reinforcing the picture that there's a problem going on. Uh, in, in my opinion, intelligence always has to be actionable. And uh, that's why these civilian offshore patrol vessel campaigns, these joint SC partnerships are critically important because it allows the governments to actually go intercept the vessels, to board and inspect them at sea, to find the, the infringements, and to then bring them back to, to shore and actually uh, deliver justice. Mm -hmm. I'll add to that as well that I think one of the major challenges is getting people to care about this. I think without that, politics we all know is a popularity contest, and I think governments will only act upon things when the demographics that they that they represent are putting enough pressure on it. And so the more people care about this issue, the more we can start putting pressure on politicians to put resources into managing those areas of water. And I think, you know, look, I think the biggest problem isn't just the illegal fishing, it's, it's all fishing. But if we can't tackle the illegal fishing first, then I don't know what hope we have for the rest of the ocean. Uh, in, in order to protect our goal to, uh, of, of protecting 30% of our seas from industrial fishing. So really, the, 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 the tackle or the, the fight against IUU fishing is like the, the hurdle that we need to get past before we can move on to protect the rest of the sea. Yeah, can I just add something as well? Um, I think I just want to reinforce what Peter said about the gulf between what's on paper and what's actually happening in reality out on the ocean. And this happens on both sides, you know, with the MSC. Just going back to your earlier question, a lot of uh, you know what they do sounds really good on paper, and that's why people obviously look for this tick. Um, but it's a, there's a huge that's a huge difference between enforcing it, um, and I think that's yeah that's probably the biggest um, takeaway from that I learned on this film is that there's it's just um, you know you could interview the MSC and, and and groups like that, and they'd tell you things that you want to hear, and and it's all good in 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 idea, but not so good in practice. Uh, the, absolutely. And the Labico 2 is the perfect example of that, because the Labico 2 was legally licensed to fish in the waters of Liberia using long line fishing gear to catch tuna. And had it not been for boardings and inspections at sea, supported by Sea Shepherd, the Liberian Coast Guard would have never discovered that there wasn't a single tuna on board. They were only targeting sharks and they weren't using long line fishing gear. They were using deep sea gill nets, which are essentially invisible curtains of death. Um, it to, to bring this vessel to justice, to shut down their illegal slaughterhouse of sharks, um, the government needed the ability, the, the, the asset, to actually board and inspect them. All right. Well, um, we're, we're getting a lot of questions from you all in here. That's really great, and we really appreciate that. Um, there, there's there's a few um, few questions here that I'd like to, to, to send to you, Peter. Um, that that I'm going to combine a few of them. So sorry that I'm not asked uh, and answering or asking all of them individually. Um, it's it's the uh, the process of uh, after these ships are found. You know what role does the military and the coast guard and the authorities play on board, and what happens after a ship is is arrested as well? Are they confiscated? Are they sunk? What what happens to them? So the process is that uh, when a vessel is identified as suspicious, the, the Navy or the Coast Guard make the decision to board the ship. The Sea Shepherd vessel, the Bob Barker or the Sam Simon or the Ocean Warrior launch one of our small boats, the RIB, with a law enforcement detachment on board of the Coast Guard Navy and fisheries. Um, they immediately intercept the target. The Coast Guard and Navy go on board and they secure the vessel to make sure that it's safe for the inspection team to come on board. And then once they've given the go ahead, the inspection can begin. The inspection includes checking vessel documentation, checking fishing gear, checking um, cargo holds to see if they have any endangered species or protected species, ensuring that the reporting matches what they're actually catching. If there's any infringements, then the government can make the decision to arrest that vessel and bring them back to port for further investigation. The penalties depend on the offense, and they also depend a lot on what the legal framework is of the country. And we see all over the world that in a lot of cases, the legal framework has to catch up to the problem. Uh, an example is in Tanzania. Uh, we assisted the Tanzanian police service to board and arrest a vessel that was fitting sharks. 
the vessel was brought back to port in Tanzania. The ship was actually forfeited to the state of Tanzania. It's been four years now, and the vessel still has not gone out to fish. It's just sitting in port. The captain, the agent, and the owner were all sentenced to 20 years imprisonment, which is a serious statement from the side of the Tanzanian government that illegal fishing isn't going to be tolerated. Another example would be in Benin, where we've been working for two, three years. When we started our campaign in Benin, um, the Beninese Navy arrested three vessels for illegal fishing. And the maximum fine allowable under Beninese law was $10,000 for illegal fishing, right? But because of the arrest of these vessels and the media attention that was gotten in, in Benin, the president himself got involved in the issue. And he approached the maritime commissioner and the minister of fisheries and the minister of defense and all the stakeholders. And he asked them, what is the penalty? And when they told him that $10,000 was the maximum they could throw at them, then he called for a revision of the law. That's why when uh, last year, six months ago, when we assisted the Beninese authorities to arrest another two vessels fishing illegally in Benin, those two vessels were actually forfeited to the state. The captains were sentenced to 11 months imprisonment. And that's and, and the case was charged by the, a special court on economic crimes and terrorism. And that's because thanks to the case brought by the Navy, supported by Sea Shepherd, the government could see where there were loopholes in the law where the law could be strengthened. So now in Benin, the maximum penalty for illegal fishing is not a $10,000 fine, but instead a $1.5 million fine. And the government has showed that they're willing to, to actually seize vessels, which is incredibly encouraged. And I'm grateful for the leadership and the vision of the government of Benin in taking this strong action against illegal fishing. Um, I don't really think we could have done anything differently. I mean, the questions that we asked were pretty straightforward um, and we didn't go in there trying to elicit the responses that we got. So I don't think we could really go back and do anything differently, um, to be honest. I, I think the question was pretty straightforward. Why aren't, why isn't fishing part of, part of you know, your website? Why isn't the fishing industry addressed mm. in these plastic campaigns? Yeah, and I think, if anything, you know, we... We're not trying to make enemies, you know. We're, we're really trying to unite under under an actual narrative that, that makes sense to the public. And, and we're facing a incredibly complicated global issue. And thankfully, the solutions are really quite simple when you just write them down. And so we just like organisations to unite under 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 na narrative that actually acknowledges the leading killer of our oceans as the fishing industry. And we have an open invitation to anyone who we may have challenged in the film. If they come forward and, and start uh, acknowledging these issues, we'll gladly applaud them as well. So, um, you know, I think I think we did what we could in the film. Awesome. Well, I think uh, everyone who has watched this so far uh, definitely probably agree with that. So, um, so yeah. Um, there's uh, there's also uh, a question here from Stereo Panda One Thousand, um, mm -hmm. who uh, who says uh, you guys do great. Um, but what else uh, can you do to improve the situation with illegal fishing except for coming, becoming vegan and speaking out about it? Uh, I can chip in on this. Uh, you know, I think we have a propensity to overcomplicate things. You know, we're always looking for that, that secret thing. What is it? What else can we do? Well, the, so the solutions are really honestly that simple. We need to reduce and eliminate fish consumption, moving towards a plant-based diet where, as much as possible. If that means going vegan or plant-based overnight, that's fantastic. Or even if you move in that direction just a few days a week, then we need to start uh, challenging and lobbying governments to end those destructive fishing uh, subsidies, anywhere from 20 to $35 billion a year. And then we also need to create marine protected areas that actually mean marine protected areas. And the way we enforce and make sure of that is there needs to be no catch zones and there needs to be enforcement. Get those three things and I think we're on a good path to restoring the oceans. Um, just to add to that, I, yeah, I fully agree. I mean, I think there's both individual responsibility and governmental. You need both, you know, both of these levels working. But one of the criticisms that I've heard to the film is, um, you know, this is a complex problem that needs complex, 
complex solutions. And I just don't, I think that's only the case if you want to keep continuing to eat fish and exploiting the ocean when you don't have to. Um, mm. I, I don't think it's it's a really complex solution. I think it's simply leave the ocean alone. And, mm. was, and it Einstein, was it Einstein that said, like, if you can't uh, summarize explain, things, explain uh, things simply, yeah, then you then maybe you don't, don't understand, understand it. Well it. Enough. So, and, and also those complicated messages don't translate to the public and often not into politics either. So simple messages are the way forward. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we have, uh, I'm going to mix and match a few questions here, uh, just, to, just to get them together. So, um, this one is for uh, you, Peter. Um, so it's, it's basically along the lines of, uh, why, like what, what Sea Shepherd does around Africa seems to be something that a government should be doing, not an NGO. Um, so, so can you, can you talk to, can you talk to that? And, um, yeah. So we work with countries whose economic resources are are stretched, right? So in some cases, our country partners don't have the vessel assets that can cover the entirety of their waters, or, or maybe they're, they're limited in range. So maybe they can go out 20 nautical miles offshore, but their exclusive economic zone goes out 200 miles, which means they can only cover 10% of the entire water area, the maritime area that they're responsible for. There could be cases where they they do have vessels uh, and maybe the vessel does have that range but they they don't have the fuel or they don't have the spare parts or there's all kinds of other logistical challenges um, it could be that um, they they have the fuel and the vessel but the vessel is uh, is a is a defense asset under the navy or the coast guard and of course the ministry of defense has many areas of responsibility not just fisheries but also uh, stopping narco trafficking uh, the national national security uh, the national defense and so fisheries is just one area that they're focused on what what our campaigns allow the government to do is to have a platform that is solely dedicated to fisheries protection that that's a luxury that really only very few developed countries have and yet we're providing it to countries that 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 have economic resources that are that are stretched all right um, here is a question for all three of you. So just, uh, just um, yeah, someone grab it. Uh, why is bycatch so rarely spoken about? I don't know why it's so rarely spoken about. <laughs> hmm. I think hmm, here's here's my here's my thing with bycatch. I mean, it's a it's a definition which just just means the the fish that's discarded after catching a target species. And what's happened is in some fisheries. They've shown that, hey, look, we're improving. Look, our bycatch rates are going down. One of the reasons for that just could, could just be that the, the larger fish that they were catching are now gone, and now they have to rely on those smaller fish, and it gives a false impression of an improved fishery. Um, but look, fish overall are the forgotten victims of the food production system of the planet. We don't like to think about fish. I mean, we barely think about cows, pigs, and chickens. And... I don't know exactly. Maybe it's a psychological um, process. Maybe. I think it's been so rarely talked about up until now because it's something that's really quite easily hidden. I mean, all this stuff happens so far offshore. You know, it's really really easy to hide. Just throw them back overboard. Um, Include like who's monitoring it? I guess is um, it's it's one of those things that's just really slid under the radar for for so long. And I'm so glad that this film was was able to highlight it because, yeah, I mean, it's it's I think it's really wrong that it, it isn't talked about more. It's it's probably the, one of the biggest issues when it comes to fishing is the bycatch. And, and so often the discards aren't reported, right? So off the coast of Gabon, where we've been working for five years, every time that these tuna purseiners set their net to catch tuna, on average, there's about five to 10 sharks that are also caught in the net that end up also on the deck of the fishing vessel. Under the laws of Gabon, those sharks have to be, be released. But because of the physical stress and the psychological stress that the shark has gone through in, in the course of the fishing activity, which could last two or three hours, um, it's estimated that 90% of them will die. Only 10% will has any chance of surviving at all. On so many of these vessels that I've been on board personally, the vessel does not accurately keep a bycatch or discard log. And we'll be on deck watching as there's sharks inside the per se net. And we'll look at the bycatch log of this particular vessel. And they'll claim that this is the first time in a month of fishing that they've had any sharks in their net at all. Because if you go back that one month and look at every day of their discard 
uh, declaration, it's always zero sharks, zero sharks, zero sharks, zero sharks. This is this is why they really are invisible. They're they're so rarely declared. And one of the reasons that they're not declared is that the tuna industry doesn't want the public to know what the impact of the tuna fishery is on on shark populations. I I know that Jonathan Saffron Fower, I think it's Jonathan Saffron Fower in his book Eating Animals provides a really illustrative example that I always think about in terms of bycatch. He talks about the impact of the shrimp fishery where for every kilogram of shrimp caught there's eight to ten kilograms of, of other marine wildlife discarded depending on where the fishery is and he paints this picture of, of a person sitting at a restaurant and the waiter comes and gives them a plate of shrimp and then brings another eight plates of other marine wildlife and just throws it out in, in, right in front of his eyes and says well here's the rest of your meal and I think that's incredibly illustrative of how wasteful that type of fishing activity can be. It's wasteful on a level that we would never tolerate in any type of animal agriculture on land. Absolutely. Um, here is another question. It's very, very general, very broad. So, so you can you can grab it here. Um, if we were to halt IUU fishing. Uh, so that would be illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. How well and quick can the oceans recover given legal fishing levels, and can it ever fully? The, the ocean has an incredible ability to rebound uh, and, and regenerate, right? We, we understand the importance of, of national parks on land. We know what national parks and, and wilderness areas, what, what function they fill for biodiversity on land. And we need more marine parks and marine protected areas at sea. So I think these things go hand in hand. We need to we need to eliminate illegal fishing while also expanding the legal protections that that prevent overfishing outside of the illegal fishing problem as well. That includes the push and, and Ali and Lucy have been great at talking about this, of putting aside 30 percent of the world's oceans as marine protected area. Uh, some people even argue for that that should biologically be 50 percent of, of the oceans. But 30 percent is something that many United Nations member states have agreed on as a goal. But but beyond that, those 30 percent, uh, those areas have to be no take zones. The majority of marine protected areas still allow fishing. They may limit certain types of fishing, but they, they are areas where you can take fish. I think we have a tendency sometimes to be overwhelmed in terms of we're a movement that's trying to save the oceans. But what we have to do is identify these areas of critical biodiversity. If we can protect them, I mean seriously protect them, both with legislation and with enforcement, then that will allow areas to rebound. There'll be what's known as biological spillover. So if there's an area where there's a lot of marine wildlife regenerating, then that will go and repopulate other areas as well. Can I just add something to that? Um, I've, I fully agree that the oceans can bounce back really quickly if they're allowed to and, you know, no take zones. But when you get into sort of, if we just theoretically um, wiped out all the um, IUU fishing. Um, we've got to remember that the majority of fishing is legal fishing um, and we're talking about no take zones in order to give the oceans that chance to bounce back. So illegal fishing is a really good start but I, I feel like you know we have to remember that the bulk of this is is perfectly legal. So. Absolutely. And we need to see a rewilding of the oceans. Uh, we're, we're already looking at the oceans from, from a diminished state. And it's mm -hmm. the fishery scientist, Daniel Pauly, who talks about shifting baseline theory, which is basically that our concept of what is a bountiful marine environment is different than our parents' idea of it, our grandparents' idea of it, and so on. There, there's all of these um, accounts from the 1600s and 1700s of Europeans coming to North America and talking about there being so much cod off of Newfoundland that uh, you could actually anchor your ship and walk to shore across the backs of cod. And for us, that sounds so fantastical. We can't even imagine that that's true. That's clearly an exaggeration from our perspective. But there's so many accounts of this from different countries at the time, information that wasn't shared between countries, that, that those accounts are probably quite accurate. So our idea of what is sustainable today, again, it's already being measured against a diminished state, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a depleted state. And, and we also have to consider one of the biggest challenges facing the oceans is climate change. And last year, the United Nations came out with a terrifying statistic, which is that off the coast of West Africa, by 2100, due to climate change alone, fish populations will likely fall by 85%. That's not because of fish, that's by climate change alone. So 
going on this course of business as usual is, is just is is not possible. We need to create ecological resistance that requires a hands-off approach to the oceans so they can rebound so that we can take on the challenges we're, we're facing in the future as well, which is climate at the turn of the century. And, and when people measure sustainability, do they consider that? Do they consider what fish populations were like 300 years ago? Do they consider what the impact is of climate on these fish populations 50 years from now? No, that's that's rarely calculated. They're calculating what were they catching last year and, and are they able to catch the same amount of fish this year as last year? Yeah, for sure. Um, just to change it up a little bit, uh, we're having some, some Sea Shepherd related questions, but for Ali and Lucy, uh, people would love to know. Oh man, I mean, it was incredible that we were able to get out to sea and that was really thanks to Peter. Uh, I thanks, believe, Peter. We're, you know, we're in another country and we said, look, we gotta, we gotta get out to sea and check out this, uh, illegal fishing problem. Can you get us on a boat? It was like, let's make it happen. Come down to West Africa and. I think it was New Year's Eve or something. <laughs> we just got, got on a plane and came down and it was an incredible experience to be able to, you know, be at sea, witness the marine life, witnessing those huge pods of dolphins yeah. at the, in the front of the ship and, and seeing the, you know, the next day, the huge levels of destruction that's happening out there um, and being inspired by the, the tenacity of the crew and how dedicated they were. And I mean, not to mention the great food on the vessel, which is incredible. Um, and it just it just fully immersed us into the reality of what's happening on the other side of the horizon. Yeah, I'm really glad we were able to actually get out to sea for an ocean documentary. So that was a great opportunity. It was and it was so educational because despite my years of um, support for Sea Shepherd, I actually had no idea, evidently, of what they're actually doing out there. So I had no idea how they would board other vessels, and mm -hmm. and it was just really um, it was really amazing to see it in action. And it was mm -hmm. a great opportunity to get out there and. and really good on the ocean and as, as Ali said the food was great and um, it was just a really great experience. I also add just how professional Sea Shepherd were and, and it sounds weird to not expect it but it really was it did feel like everyone was military it was like a military operation everyone knows their place everyone knows their role everyone everything's by the time everything's just so it's like clockwork. It's but everyone's just so hands-on and everyone's like even just with things like the dishes everyone's just like trying to get in there and do their part you know mm -hmm. like it's just everyone's so wanting to be involved and, and pull their weight and it was just really great mm -hmm. great well that's really good to hear um i mean peter you're uh you're no newbie to sea shepherd chips uh you've been a while around for what uh two decades or so in, in sea shepherd um so we have a question here from chris um what experience on an illegal fishing vessel stands out most to you the Labico 2, for sure, is one of those just horrific cases of just, just imagining how much marine wildlife one single boat can kill. So as, as shark conservationists, we know figures like between 73 to 100 million sharks are killed every single year. Here was one single boat that nobody knew about operating in the Shadowlands that was taking half a million sharks every single year. How many other vessels like the Labico 2 are out there, right? It speaks to the ungovernable oceans. I think a vessel that really sticks out in my mind is a vessel called the Victory 205, which was arrested in the Gambia. Uh, it was a Chinese-owned vessel. The crew on board, the officers were Chinese nationals. The crew on board were, were from, uh, from the Gambia. And the living conditions on board this ship were just some of the worst I had ever seen in my life. The crew slept in a small crawl space. I, I can't describe it in any other way than basically like a pizza oven. This was a metal box right above the engine room, underneath the bridge. You, you wouldn't be able to sit up in this. You could basically just lay down like, a, like sardines in a, in a, in a can. Um, it could fit about two people. Six people lived in that space for months and months at a time. I crawled in myself. I couldn't handle more than five minutes because of the heat. And, and that's, where, that's where they lived. We had a journalist on board uh, named Ian Urbina who has an incredible project called the Outlaw Ocean Project. And he describes it really well. He, talks, he spoke to the fishermen and they told him how when seas were rough, the water would actually flood this metal box. It's basically like, like, a, like living in a buried coffin. And 
there were exposed wires, the, the crew would get electrocuted. Uh, one of the crew members had a foot infection that was so over the top bad that if it that he probably would have lost his foot if it wasn't for our medic coming on board and and draining his foot and giving him antibiotics. Uh, the living conditions on board these ships are absolutely appalling. That ship in particular will stay with me for for a long, long time. I, I remember I remember the smells. I remember what it felt like, and I remember the the just how nauseous I was being on that vessel. Not not from seasickness, but that people could treat other human beings that way. Right, and and likewise, Lucy and, and Ali, is there anything from Seaspiracy that like stood out to you? Something you would like to underscore that maybe was yeah, anything like that? I mean, there's so there's so many things. I mean, there's the sense of betrayal that some of these labels that you trusted your whole life are in fact based on nothing. There's the the sense of injustice, speaking to the the Thai slaves and, and all that they had gone through not speaking to family for you know six years, 10 years, they'll tell you by how many days to the exact number they've been at sea, the smell of alcohol in their breath, knowing that you know they've been self-medicating their trauma. There's, there's so much that sticks with us, the Faroe Islands, um, but also just the scale, I think, of this issue, the, the millions of vessels out at sea, the trillions of fish that are caught, the, the you know, billions of acres of seafloor that are damaged, Everything is just so huge. And like Peter said about the Lapico, the Lapico you know, you, you hear these numbers of estimates of 70 million to 200 or 200 million sharks that kill every year. These are just estimates. And, and, and when, it, when you come across a, a vessel like the Lapico too, you realize actually the number could be far, far greater and we just have no idea about it. But uh, Just to echo what Ali said, I mean, some of the stories from the ex-slaves is definitely going to stay with me uh, forever as, as the Faroe Islands in terms of just raw, like... Um, close sort of graphic uh like the idea that i mean that's happening all over and, and for the most part we don't see it we don't document it um mm -hmm. yeah it's um it's horrific and, and this is why we really do need to form coalitions with labor rights organizations with human rights organizations in these environmental problems don't exist in a vacuum and i think as conservationists we have to acknowledge where there's intersectionality, where there's an overlap, um, and, and where we're fighting for, for the same values. Um, as, as fishing vessels go out further and stay out longer to catch fewer and fewer fish, uh, there's certain fixed costs that are associated with the fishing activity. They're going to burn the same amount of fuel every day. That's that's unavoidable. They're going to be using the same amount of fishing gear every year. Every every few years, they're going to dry dock the vessel to do maintenance periods. The only cost they can really cut down on as there's fewer and fewer fish is labor. And that's why there's been this trend of hiring people and paying them $150 a month or $250 a month to do some of the most dang to do the most dangerous job in the world. And uh, if people were not mistreated, if people were paid livable wages, if people were fa paid fair wages, then, then the illegal fishing couldn't continue either, right? By, by giving, by fighting for labor rights, we can protect the environment. Generally, oh, sorry, the uh, sorry. I just, I just realized the question didn't go out there to the audience. So Barbara was asking, who are the people who, who are fishing illegally? Are they just uh, greedy uh, people who earn a lot of money from this, or are they uh, people who have no other option to do it than uh, just to survive? I think we have to distinguish between the owners of the vessels the officers on the vessels and the crew who are working on board the vessels. So if we take the Lobico 2 as an example, uh, the crew on board who were largely Liberian crew, they were getting paid about 200 to two, maybe 150 to $250 a month. The captain who was a Portuguese national was being paid about $6,000 a month. So he was certainly profiting a great deal. Uh, the Liberian crew were, were trying to get by to pay school fees and, and things like that that they have to do on shore, but they're, they're living in terrible conditions and, and it's really hard, horrific work. And, and the, the beneficial owners of the vessel would, would make substantial amounts of money. So the owners who hide behind these shell companies, beneficial owners in China, in Europe predominantly, 
um, yes, for them, it, it's it's pure greed. For the crew, uh, the fishers on board the ships, uh, most of them are really just trying to get by. Uh, Liam, um, Lucy, do you have anything to add? Yeah, sorry, we cut out there for a second. Just just to carry on from from uh, basically the economics of slavery, which is happening now. You know, the, the, these are human beings behind these vessels. Some of them do have to do this uh, to get by. And with the lack of fish, these vessels are resorting to other means of making their living, whether that's um, the, the smuggling of weapons or the smuggling of drugs. And I recently learned a fact that every year, fishing vessels are smuggling in the region of $80 billion worth of drugs uh, from port to port. And so, I mean, this this is probably going to be happening more and more as our oceans become diminished. These vessels are going to be used for something. Um, so these 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 issues are interconnected. And uh, so we're about an hour in here, so we're going to start wrapping up here. So, so um, yeah, it's uh, people. A lot of people, and I said, I mean, a lot of people are asking Ali and Lucy, uh, what, what's next? Is there going to be a conspiracy too, or uh, what's coming up? <laughs> well, I think that look, we we have we have so many other subjects that we'd like to cover in documentaries. Uh, we like to keep things close to our chest and up our sleeve, and, and come out with them when they're ready. Um, but I think if people want to be keeping up to date with what we're doing, they can follow us on Instagram, either our own personal accounts um, or Seaspiracy at Seaspiracy, where everything's going to be going outtakes from the film, more revealing facts. Uh, and things as they're happening on the ground. We've got the G7 summit next month. We're going to be doing a lot on that. And also to sign our petition. And, and we're really pushing towards that. Uh, Change.org uh, forward slash Seaspiracy and, and sign that petition to help protect 30% of our oceans by the year 2030. And of course, Ali and Lucy, it goes without saying that you have an open invitation to, to come back to the ships. Yeah, we will. We will. I miss being at sea. I really do. Yeah. Well, good. Um, well, thank you so much for all for joining our, our live stream here with uh, Captain Peter Hammerstead, Ali and Lucy Tabrizi of uh, Seaspiracy. Um, I hope you will uh, join us next time. Uh, so thank you so much. See you later. Support Sea Shepherd. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>